Baruch Hata, Praise to you, Lord our God, rule of the universe, who has made us holy with your commandments and commanded us to busy ourselves with the words of Torah. So, with that, I'm going to share my screen. All right, um, Hindo. Actually, Doris, would you read our first text, please? Jacob and Esau on one foot. Jacob and Esau, a three-act story by David Schwartz. Jacob and Esau on one foot. This is the story from the biblical book of Genesis. It tells the story of twins and their struggles with each other. Thank you. And just for clarification, I am the author of the source sheet, but not the author of the story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Hinda, would you read our prologue, please? Prologue. Oops. Too high. Too high? Uh oh. Is that better? Genesis 25, 20, 26. Isaac was 40 years old when he took his wife, Rebecca. Daughter of Bethuel, Aramean, of Hadam Aram, sister of Laban, Aramean. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and the Lord responded to his plea, and his wife Rebecca conceived. But the children struggled in her womb, and she said, yeah. If so, why do I exist? She went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord answered her, Two nations are in your womb, two separate people shall issue from your body. One people shall be mightier than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. First one emerged red like a hairy mantle all over, so they named him Esau. Then his brother emerged, holding on to the heel of Esau, so they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. Go ahead and read the context and then the first question, please. This is from the biblical book of Genesis. At what point could this story have been changed? All right. So, a question. Yes. Where did Rebecca go to inquire of the Lord? Why did she have to go any place? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, um, it's in, people have been pondering that for a long time. Um, the Midrashim say, who do they say that she went to? They say that she went to somebody, not Abraham, but somebody else. Um, let me see if I can find that quickly. Um, but it's one of those, it's one of those things that um, that's been a question. No high right. priest at the time. That's true. There was no high priest at the time. Um, all right. The Eighth claim doesn't give that particular answer, but I know that there is an answer. Um, so I will look into it and get back to everybody. Good question. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. Uh, Bethuel is, I'm trying, I, I'm a little mixed up here. Mm -hmm. So Rebecca is the daughter of Bethu, Bethuel. Mm -hmm. And Bethuel is the sister of Laban? No, that's a good question. It's, it's, it's confusing the way it's written. She is the sister of Laban. Yes. The two and, and Laban, sorry, Rebecca and Laban are the children of Betuel. Okay. Later on, Laban will be 
the father of Rebecca and Leah. Just to round out the family tree a little bit. Mm -hmm. and I mean Rachel and Leah, don't you? Thank you, Rachel and Leah. Um, and I want to say, but Tuo is um, but Tuo is related to Abraham. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, looking that up. Betuel is the son of Abraham's brother Nahor. Yeah. That's why he's sent to look for a wife though, with them. Keeping the right. family. Right. But given that Abra given that I given that Abraham was so old, Rebecca and Isaac are around the same age, even though they're technically a generation off from each other. Rebecca is Abraham's great niece. Yes. David, why are these women, because I think of Sarah also, why are they barren in the Bible? And they're old before they conceive. I mean, is there a mm -hmm. theme there? I mean, you know, I, at least with those two generations, I'm just very curious because it seems to be highlighted in what we just what we just read. Yeah. Um, so it depends on how you like to approach the question of why things are the way they are in the Bible. Um, one way of looking at it is that infertility is an issue and has been an issue for generations all the way back to the time of the Bible. And it happens to be that the people that feature in our stories all struggled with it. Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. So three generations of infertility issues. Um, and then it pops up every so often after that as well, like Hannah, which, we read about um, for the Haftor of Rosh Hashanah day one. Um, another way of looking at it is that it's designed to send a message. Um, one can go down that road. One just has to be very careful when going down that road that you don't suggest implicitly or explicitly that somebody who struggles with infertility has done so because they've done something wrong or has have had enough faith in God or something where you're blaming people for their own problems with this area. Um, yeah, and I'm sure there are other answers as well to why these issues exist, um, why this theme comes up. Mm, but it's normal when, to me it's was, yeah. to me it's a normal cross-section of of life that I, I experienced you know very directly one way or the other with uh if the family and uh, nuclear family as well as uh you know extended family and and people we know it's not it's not uncommon yeah i i always thought that it's always expressed this way, that women who are barren pray to God and God gives them a gift. And I, my feeling was that they're stressing that children are a gift from God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that that the that you have to also think about the implications of that that like what if you pray to god and god says no mm. like like it's it's hard mm. what it 
building off of that, um, could it be then as it as it relates to other parts of the Tanakh where it talks about, um, for example, in Isaiah talking about um how God has power over uh both life and death, that it just is another way of expressing God's universal sovereignty over any situation. It can be as general as like a general uh, theological yeah. notion. Yeah, it it certainly could be. Um, you get into theological issues with one's relationship with God if you like want children and you're not getting them, but potentially one could end up in that in that theological conundrum from other roots as well. Um, I mean, looking at that general idea, there are more things about God. There's, and, or specifically God's powers. There's the God controls everything and chooses to not give, chooses to do all sorts of things that we might find undesirable, like car accidents and hurricanes and infertility for reasons that are beyond our understanding. That's one approach that's certainly well grounded in Jewish tradition. And then there's another approach among other among multiple ways of looking at this that says that mm -hmm. um, God is the is a force for good, but God is not all powerful. Because if God is all powerful and all good, like either God, either God can can do things but chooses not to, or God wants to do things but can't do them. Like that, God can't be both all powerful and all good, which is a Greek way of thinking about God in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, omnipotent and um, omnivalent. Um, so, so another way of looking at God is to say that God is a force for good in the world and God grieves when bad things happen to us, sometimes because of people using their free will that God gave us and sometimes because of things that happen in the world, um, like hurricanes. Um, and and God is with us when in our, in our sorrow, um, and God can be found with the people who are helping, and that can be a better that can be a way of thinking about God that works for some people. Um, I haven't had to deal with loss in my own life yet, in a very personal way. Um, but my understanding from reading about others who have, such as Harold Kushner, um, is that that is a way of thinking about God that works for some people. So I present it to you. Perhaps it may work for you. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I think another issue that appears in this section is that God has a long range plan. He knows before these babies are born that there'll be two separate nations and what's going to happen in the future. So that there's a long-term plan that maybe we don't understand in the present. Mm -hmm. What if you had asked David, this could have turned out differently? Yeah. Um, it says that the children struggled in her womb. You might substitute the word struggled for fought. Back and forth, that began, that image of the two of them fighting started in the womb, not getting along in the womb. At the bottom, then his brother emerged holding onto the heel of Isha. Maybe Jacob was holding onto the heel so Isha couldn't get out. Maybe he was hoping to get out before his brother. Um, 
to claim to be the heir, successor of uh, his father. So I don't know, I think maybe God had a plan, but maybe Jacob was trying to ruin it by trying mm. to hold back Esau from giving, coming out and getting ahead of him. Yeah. Yeah, well, we know later on he did. Why I teach me, David, why Jacob, why the name is because he was holding on to the heel of his brother. Yeah. Um, so Yaakov is meaning Jacob. Um, you'd become Jay's in translation. Um, Yaakov comes from the same word as heel, a cave, ayin kuf vet. Um, so he was holding on to his brother's heel, so they called him heel. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Um, I, I was just looking here. I mean, there were there are six other cases of barren women in the Torah. Mm. And uh, what's interesting is usually when when they pray for a child, if it's a male child, that male child would be given to serve God and be a Nazarite. Um, so why why didn't that happen to Esau? I mean, if he was the firstborn. Um, so is that six other cases in the Torah or in the Tanakh? Um, it says, let's see, this is in, uh, just says in the Bible. In the Bible. Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and then in Genesis, Hannah, and then also uh, the anonymous wife of Manoah. Yeah. Mother of Samson. Yeah. So of those examples, Samson and Samuel are dedicated to God. The others are not. So Sarah's child is Isaac. Rebecca's children are Jacob and Esau. Rachel's children are Joseph and Benjamin. Um, was there another one that I missed? Yeah. Hannah's, yeah. Hannah's son is Samuel, who gets devoted to, who gets dedicated to God. Um, he gets apprenticed to the priest, the high priest Eli, um, and eventually becomes the last of the judges in the beginning of the, and um, anoints King Solomon and King David. Um, but after he's weaned, he gets, he goes to live in the temple, and his mom visits him a couple times a year with some new clothes. Would it have been Isaac or Ishmael? Because he was born to Abraham. The Sarah was the one who was barren, or was the was the one who was unable to have children for a very long time. So Isaac is the is the one from Sarah. I was also. Hey, the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was also going to add, um, doesn't the is it wasn't the Nazarite vow, didn't that only appear at a later point as well after the giving of the yes. Torah? Yes, that's true. That only that appears in the book of Numbers. Um and the patriarchs are in Genesis. So pre presumably, uh oh well, at least I would think the then the concept of the Nazarite vow, like as an idea, probably at least as a binding thing, wasn't mm -hmm. around until the, Wait, when the Torah yeah. was given at Sinai. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yes. Yep, good connection. All right, let's move on to Act 1, now that we've looked at the prologue. Do, do, do. All right, Jesse, would you read Act 1, please? Mm -hmm. 
Sure. <clears throat> when the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the outdoors, but Jacob was a mild man who stayed in camp. Isaac favored Esau because he had a taste for game, but Rebecca favored Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the open, famished, and Esau said to Jacob, give me some of that red stuff to gulp down, for I am famished, which is why he was named Edom. Mm -hmm. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. And Esau said, I am at the point of death. So of what use is my birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob then gave Esau bread and lentil stew. He ate and drank and he rose and went away. Thus did Esau spurn the birthright. Thank you. Okay, the context and first question, please. Mm -hmm. um, context, this picks up right after the previous text left off. At what points could the story have been changed? Jacob could have been more generous just giving him the stew without asking for anything. Hmm. And Esau could have valued more his birthright. Because once he gets something to eat, or he could say, no, it's worth more, I'll, I'll find something, or I'll ask somebody else for some food. Well, it certainly picks up on the theme from the prior paragraphs because Jacob was trying to, you know, hold on to Esau, as we said, maybe, so he could be the first one out. And now he's getting that birthright through trickery. So obviously that birthright was very important, or that place in the family, shall we say, was very important, was probably more important to Jacob than to Esau. Hmm. How much influence does the fact that Rebecca favored Jacob and Isaac favored, uh, Rebecca favored Jacob and Isaac favored, Isaac favored Esau play into all this, all this stuff? In this and they show the obvious, in the whole scenario, everything that happened, the fact that they were so obvious in showing who's the favorite, as opposed to at least pretending to like them both equally. Mm. How would that have changed Act One, the text that's in front of us? Perhaps if Jacob didn't feel ignored by his father, he wouldn't have been so anxious to get something from Asa. Yeah. And there wouldn't be the same jealousy. Nice. And why did <laughs> Hi, it's interesting because Isaac and Jacob shared so many of the same qualities. They're both mild-mannered and they both studied. Esau was a whole different animal. Um, you'd think that Jacob and Isaac would have been seen because of that, but no, Isaac favored Esau. And if Esau was that famished, why didn't you go to his mother for some food? That would have been the logical source, I would think. Mm. But she favored Jacob. Maybe Esau was had anger with his mother or was figured that Jacob was a, a conduit to her in some other way, so he went to him. He might how old how old were the brothers would you say when this incident occurred were they children were they young adults i'm just very curious because then you know you think about culpability and judgment and all of that it's hard to know um looking at the hebrew um when the the boys grew up so I would say, based off the evidence here, Esau's, I would say a minimum age of early teens, insofar as there are cultures um, where when you hit puberty, 
um, you would be treated as an adult if you could bring back food for the community like an adult would. Um, so I would say that they're probably at least early teens, um, but they could be, they could be up to their 20s maybe, maybe I guess, older. I guess the reason I'm even saying that is because it took me a while till I realized Isaac was an adult uh, during the at the time of the Akeda story. And that changed it for me because it wasn't this child going up with his dad, with his dad to be sacrificed, but he was an adult. So um, I'm kind of you know doing that overlay here that I think it, at least in my mind, it would make a difference the way I would interpret the story. So that's why I'm asking. Sure. Yeah. In that first I paragraph that we read, didn't it say when she was questioning uh, what was in her womb that the elder would serve the younger. Mm -hmm. Yep. So does that fit in here somewhere then? Probably insofar as currently the younger is literally serving food to the elder. Right. Yeah. Um, but the birthright is what is is what gives the elder the um, the authority in the family. So, so this is a step on the way to the elder serving the younger. The younger. Mm -hmm. As we know, um, this has already been preordained. Predicted is not ordained. Well. If God suggested it, I would say it's ordained. Looking from looking from a purely narrative or purely literary viewpoint, one could also look at this text and say, well, whoever wrote the story knew how it was going to come out, so they put in foreshadowing at the beginning. Um, but if you go into the world of the story and take it at face value, then yes, it looks like it has been preordained. And again, this is one of multiple ways of, of reading the Bible. Well, whoever was writing it down wrote it after the events occurred. So then um, they would know you couldn't write it ahead of the events occurring unless you could uh, have that uh, power to foresee. Mm -hmm. So, and so this could have been adjusted one way or the other. I mean, unless you consider yep. that this came, this came down directly from, from from the divine being, from the heavenly powers, and it's it's you know altered. It wasn't altered by human hand, unless it was done accidentally when you're transcribing it. So, right. and and even then, <laughs> my understanding of that approach to biblical authorship is that it was Moses that received the Torah. In which case, if that is true that God gave the Torah and like lock, stock and barrel to Moses on Mount Sinai over the course of those 40 days, then this is still being transmitted after it happened. <laughs> yeah. David, can I just uh, go to the preordained question and something you Please. said earlier? How do the Jews, I mean, it's not to the story specifically, but how does Judaism think of things being preordained in conflict with the concept of free will? I mean, it's a Calvinist kind of strong and some of the Protestant sects. Did Judaism, just because it's written out, does it believe it's in preordainment or is there different concepts here? Yeah, that's a question that people have been trying to figure out for 2000 years. Um, so you are- I always like easy questions. So, so you, are, you are joining a long conversation, Alan. Um, Pierre Kevot, 
later on after we after what we've gotten to so i'm guessing maybe chapter four um i think it's rabbi akiba who says everything is preordained and yet freedom of will is given and as soon as he said that everybody else is like huh and people have been trying to <laughs> decipher that one ever since could you repeat that everything is preordained but everything is preordained yet freedom of will is given ah so so i think the way that it's looked at is just because i god know how you're going to do things doesn't doesn't absolve you from the responsibility to make good choices because you can say if everything's preordained then like why is it my fault that I stole something? Like, I it was foreseen, I was going to do it. You can't blame me for doing what I was pre-programmed to do. And, and yet the answer is, well, yes, maybe God knew that you were going to do that, but you, you still made that choice. And God, God wasn't influencing you, God simply like, saw all the ways that the game could have played out when there uh, is yeah. when there's a bowl of ice cream and a bowl of liver on the table your mother knows which way you're going to go but you still have a choice yes so god may know which way you're going to go which decisions you're going to make but it's still your choice to make them Yeah. <laughs> hmm. It all depends if the liver had onions on it, or which way would you go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if I was on the first course of dessert. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't put onions on the ice cream. That's very disgusting. <laughs> well, if you keep kosher, it couldn't be for the same meal. <laughs> Good one, Charles. Well, <laughs> ask that of a pregnant woman sometime and see what happens. Pick up some. It also seems from this first act, too, that Jacob is smarter than Esau. Mm. Esau is the guy out in the outdoors, and Jacob, just because he's mild, doesn't mean he's not smart. And he seems smart as his brother by getting the birthright from him. At least devious. I would say devious, maybe even more so than intelligent. It was really, really so so clever. Clever. Let's say clever. Oh, you're you're a diplomat. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, don't know that, I don't know that you could say Esau is not as smart. You could say he's impulsive. He's short-term thinker. Um, he kind of prone to exaggeration, you know, saying I'm at the point of death. Um, but he's not thinking ahead when he's giving he's away. He's not thinking ahead. He just cares about uh, eating, filling his gut. He cares about filling his stomach. Yeah. And once he filled his stomach, that was it. He he, he got up and left. <laughs> Yeah, but he was smart enough to hunt. It's not yeah. it's not easy to do. Yeah. Not at all. It's a different skill. But mm -hmm. I, I can coincide with you that uh, he was uh, Esau was uh, when I used to say Jacob. Uh, Jacob was the um, more strategic in his thinking and planning ahead and and having a a broader vision and not just the immediate satisfying an immediate need. Following Jacob's strategic is a wonderful way of explaining the fact that he was very deceitful. And um, Aviva Zomberg, who is a brilliant biblical commentator, modern commentator, I remember reading when I read one of her books about Brashid that um, the, the root for Jacob is Akev, which should also mean indirect and crooked. And that explains a lot of Jacob's 
personality and ways of doing things. I wonder also if um, the way um, at least Esau as the father of Adam is being described is um, narratively speaking um, I don't know if it relates to a description of the nation or habit or yeah the, the nation of Edom's general habits as, as in a perception of the nation of Edom that would later come from him as being a, just a more worldly like people so to speak who aren't necessarily interested in um, I don't know things spiritual maybe yeah I think there's something that the sages say related to that I'm not entirely sure if you could clarify yeah so so Edom was one of the neighboring kingdoms I believe in modern day Jordan um and the Edomites attacked uh or joined in with the Babylonians in destroying the temple um and like attacking Jews who are fleeing from that situation um so the book of Genesis makes it clear that Esau is credited with being the he, he's called the father of Edom um like he he basically is like the George Washington of of the kingdom of Edom um and and so th- there's definitely a connection between Esau and Adam. Um, whether or not that is like the, whether or not you, this is the Bible narrating things as they go, like, look, Esau likes red stuff. So he gets called Adam, which is red, the word for red. And oh, look, the Edomites turned out to uh, be these not so nice people. Oh, look, funny how that turned out. Or if you take a historical perspective on how the Bible came to be and you say, well, since the Edomites were enemies of the Israelites by the time of the Bible being written down, therefore the character Esau was given these uh, um, anti-Jacob traits and negative characteristics back in the founding stories of the Edomites, as we describe their founding story. Um, later on, the sages connected the fact that the Romans wore red with the fact that in Genesis, Esau is given the nickname Edom, connected to the Hebrew word for red, to say Esau equals Adam equals the Romans. And even further after that, the rabbis used Adam not only as a, um, as a stand-in um, for the Romans, but also for the Christian world. So Esau gets more and more of a bad rap as he goes on, as we look at the biblical character of Esau through the later usages of him um, as a as a stand-in to avoid censors and such. Does that help at all, Gabriel? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That gives me a little bit more uh, perspective on the topic. Thank you. Great. All right, so let's say you're Jacob. Why are you asking for the birthright? I want to be Charles in charge. Mm. You have all the, all the assets, the family, then you're able to uh, direct and make decisions when 
when you then become, you inherit uh, your birthright, mm -hmm. you're head of the family, you make decisions. And, so, I mean, so, depends, so. I mean, if you feel that you're, you're a bit of a narcissist, uh, there's two things. You want your security and you want to feel, if you're, you're, you, you, you want to feel uh, from, from an egotistical stand, the standpoint that you are, you're the guy in charge. Do we know if his mother shared her story with him? Do we know if his mother shared what with him? Her prophecy. So give oh. him the... Because that would make the most sense. If Rebecca had told him that he's supposed to be in charge, because he would normal, the second child would not normally be in charge, even though he wants to be. In a right. primo other world. I think he wanted a relationship with his father. Was he jealous of the relationship that Esau had with his father? Mm. Mm -hmm. Could be. He wanted to be an only child. The problem is, he never. even after that, he never has a relationship with his father because once he gets the father's blessing, he never sees him again. Hmm. That's true. So, it, so it didn't work out for him. But at this point, since he doesn't know what's coming, he could have wanted that. Could have been a motive. At this point, um, this exchange, this swearing of giving of surrendering the birthright is just between the two of them. There's no, there are no witnesses. So, I mean, I'm just wondering um, how binding this is, so to speak. Because I mean, there's no witnesses. It's not it's not a legal contract because just one person talking to another person. I'm just kind of curious. I mean, this obviously is a central point of this whole story, this whole narrative. And I was just you know looking at this now and thinking they were alone when this happened, right? Right. So I'm just wondering, you know, who's to know that Jacob now has the birthright? I guess that's my point. <laughs> kind of curious. Maybe he needed it to present it in his next devious act when he pretended to be Esau. But if he's going to be devious, he could have simply lied and said yeah, that. But maybe he had to present that. Yeah, that's a good point. I just, you know, because just the father was blind, remember? And the mm -hmm. only way he knew who it was was by touching. And so he had put on that hairy coat or something so that he felt like his brother. That's in the next part. <laughs> yeah. Act three, probably. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I think that he had to have that piece of paper, if it was paper, <laughs> or gold uh, David, stick, something. I wanted to ask, is there, what is the, the correlation? I mean, here you have Esau, his name being changed to Edom, and mm -hmm. Jacob later becomes Israel. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, you know, because you know, in a sense, I understand, I think that Jacob becomes Israel because he he changes. Yep. Um, so, is is it is it parallel to what happens with Esau? Um, you can name it that, or you could think of it that way. Um, that that the connection here is Edom means red. So, or Edom is related to Adom, which means red. And so he wants some of that red stuff to gulp down, so they call him red. They call him Adom, or in this case, Edom. And Adom, red, is also connected to Adama, the earth. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, and from Adama, we get Adam, the first person, so-called because the first person was said to be formed out of the Adama, the earth, which in the Middle East was probably red clay. So we've got a bunch of things all tied together. And so Esau 
here is showing a concern with earthly things mm -hmm. like food, um, very physical things, whereas Jacob wrestles with an angel and gets his name changed to Yisrael um, on grounds that he has wrestled with a with beings div divine and human, I believe is how it's explained, and he has prevailed. Um, and so this is this is kind of like the in day two of creation, the water separating into the waters above and the waters below. So you can look at this situation and say, like this little throwaway line that seems to be a throwaway line. That's why he was named Edom as which is totally unnecessary to the narrative at this point, and say that is making a point about Esau's character, and that's why he gets the name change here. Or you could look at this as a literary historical perspective and say this gets named gets put in here because it connects Esau to the Edomites through his desire for something Edom slash Adam, which is red. So you could look at it either way, um, or you could say potentially both, that it might've happened because of a desire to do narrative or to do historical connections and from this, we can take the idea, we can take this, this character trait of Esau out of this as well. The idea of multiple layers of interpretation all existing simultaneously, like a multi-layered cake. This is like I said last week, the beginning of sibling rivalry, which we're gonna see in other places also later on. Yeah, yeah it's, no. it's, a, it's a significant escalation um, we've all, we've already had Isaac or Ishmael getting sent away because he was bullying Isaac, and we've had Cain killing Abel. Right. Although one could argue that he didn't know what was going to happen because nobody had died yet. Um, but yes, this is this is definitely a significant escalation, and then we'll see that with Jacob's children as well. Right. So maybe what happened with Jacob then is he, what comes around, what goes around comes around, right? Mm. Yes, we, we see that also with uh, him being deceived by, by Laban mm -hmm. after he deceived his father. Mm. Yeah, but I think these are themes that you see, these are common threads in, in life, whether you I see know. it in the Bible or you just, you, you see these life. things happening today, those are uh, Someone who's writing this could just be a good observer of the different uh, types of personalities and characters and people and circumstances that are, are part of everyday life. Right. And then without having to go in, these are very interesting, elaborate analyses that someone builds up. It is simply the way things are and have been. Yes. All right. So I'll be respectful of people's time. So I'm going to.